Hello. So it's 10 o'clock here in Joe's basement, and uh, before we're preparing to unleash our uh, torrent of creative energy for this week's uh, Vintage Joe's Basement, just wanted to tell you that this is, in fact, our new time slot. We will, as of next episode, November the 18th and November the 25th, yes, we will no longer be coming on at 11.30. So for those of you who've tuned in at 11.30 and are seeing this and are way confused, you have two options. One, reset your clocks. Two, start tuning in at 10 o'clock to watch This Week in Joe's Basement. So enjoy this week's episode. <laughs> Eye of the Swan, an excellent vintage, the flavor that endures. This week in Joe's Basement, we bring you Vintage Joe's Basement. Yet again, our fourth episode in the series. Episode number 29, Shooting Things. Mm. Before we get on with this fine episode of Vintage Joe's Basement, I'd like to read you some non-vintage mail, because we've got some new mail this week. Which I feel compelled to respond to. Ah. Well, our first letter uh, comes from Deb Paulson on the near south side, a uh, woman who's written us before, who has excellent taste in stationery, and she writes, Dear Joe, many thanks for dropping the bombshell on Mark Audrain's marital status with surgical strike precision. As such, the damage was minimal in my neighborhood, the South Loop, and I'm ready to pick up the pieces and begin a new trail. <laughs> you see, Deb wrote us uh, a couple weeks ago to uh, ask me to play matchmaker because she was intrigued by Mark Audrain's bod, I think. Certainly not his intellect. I don't think, since I work with him. Yeah, so I guess she was pretty crushed, but she seems to be dealing with it. So she continues. I was thoroughly intrigued by your statement. You don't have to look far in this week in Joe's basement to find an available man. <laughs> Might I infer that you, Joe, the titular head of the creative triumvirate, are available? As ever, I remain fanatically yours, emphasis yours, Deb Paulson. Uh... <laughs> Well, I, it seems like loose lips can sink ships and make life dangerous for television show hosts. Um, until you send a picture of Deb in the interest of leading a private life, I will simply dedicate this, this swig to you. Mm. Yeah. Okay. You know, another one of these bashful people who've crossed out their return address, I can never understand this. See, we get a few of these. Um, we get people who write their return address, and those are always the weird ones, the ones that don't, like, don't bother to include one at all. They're, they're smart enough, you know, like King Zeke, not to give us a return address unless it's cryptic or, or interplanetary, as you'll see later in the show. But this person has, uh, has like, wrote their return address and crossed out everything except Chicago, Illinois, lest I should get bloodthirsty and send the hounds after them, I suppose. All right, so what does this person have to say? <clears throat> Comes complete with a picture of two feet. I don't think I can get mine in frame too easily, but there they are. His got shoes on. Looks like a him. Dear Joe, I've been a big fan of TWIJB this week in Joe's basement since the beginning. 
I am a North Sider, and I've been sensing an ever-present undertone of ridicule of the North Side on many of your shows. There's also a lot of ego-infested hoopla of the South Side, a territory bashing prejudice within our own city borders seems to exist that I've never sensed before. Why? North Side, for the most part, is a nice place. <coughs> It can only be a form of jealousy that fuels the north side bashing by south side bigots. Is it that the north side has a nicer lakefront, a better economy, safer neighborhoods, or is it that we can just spell our names? <clears throat> there, how does it feel? I just copped a south side attitude. You see, that shit is contagious. So, all of you south side ego freaks, chill out. I mean, the dumps with all of our north side garbage are down there for a reason. <laughs> ah, I've done it again. I better just cut this short. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I was previously unaware of any uh, north side bashing or south side prejudice in This Week in Joe's Basement. So it must be so subtle and so deeply ingrained that I've been unable to spot it. Um, so in order to ferret this out in the name of fairness, equanimity, and justice for all, I've uh, tried to give myself a new perspective on today, which is, as you can see, laundry day here in Joe's basement, by positioning myself on the north side of my basement, whereas I'm usually on the south side. I didn't, didn't realize the significance of this, so I switched over now to the north side in the effort to gain a new perspective on just how much better things look from here. Well, maybe by the end of the opening I'll find something. Thanks for listening, and I hope I didn't use too many big words. <sighs> Yours truly, M period E period R period M period E period R. <clears throat> Got another letter here from another North Sider. He's not ashamed to give his address. He says, I am not a communist sympathizer, Jeffrey Weiss. And he's decided to write to us about some uh, current events that uh, may not seem so current when the show airs. Dear Joe, in light of recent current events, i.e. Judge Clarence the Danger Thomas and Anita, get your pubic hair off my Coke can hill, I have decided not to become a senator of the United States or a judge. I have decided not to pursue that career opportunity. Primarily because my in third grade, I grabbed Amy Norton's butt on the playground. I was later reprimanded by the school principal, Mr. Netzel, and given a detention. And I just know that Amy Norton would come forth with the information at my hearing, and I would be subjected to ridicule and shame. My mother would be in bed crying every day. My, parent, my father's friends would stop envying him and stop inviting him to the Thursday night poker game. Myself, I would take up masturbation in adult theaters in the Florida State Line. My question to you, Joe, is this. What happened to me? What happened to the 80s? What's wrong with the world today? And he's a fan of the band Camper Van Beethoven. Well, gee, that's not very coherent, Jeff. Maybe you should have a little more vintage Joe's basement. And stop watching so much TV. Because TV, watching TV is not good for you. Not good for you at all. It's clearly started to eat away at your mind. And we got one, our last item of mail for the week. Purports to be from the Joe Fan Club, and it's written on the back of a piece of toilet paper. <laughs> <clears throat> so I know I have, I'll have a use for this when this, uh, when this opening's over. All those enchiladas this week, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Joe, this letter you are receiving is from the all-new Joe Winston Fan Club with 17 loyal members in our area. Have you ever had sex with a goat? <laughs> <clears throat> or sacrificed any family members for any sexual orientations? Don't you believe prostitution should be legal? Who gives a flying fuck about AIDS? You're going to die anyway, so you might as well go out with a bang, give them hell, JWFC. Mm. Oh my god. 17 members, huh? 
<laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> I think you're exaggerating. I want to see signed Afi Davids. I've been watching TV this week. Afi Davids from every, each, each and every, each and every one of you. I want to see your signatures because I don't believe that there are 17 people in a Joe Winston fan club like anywhere. <clears throat> but who knows? All right. Well, I'm out of wine, so I guess we'd, um, yeah. Can't believe it. Well, I'm, I'm definitely out of wine, so we'd better get on with the show this week. So, um, well, after this show, uh, maybe in a couple of weeks we'll, uh, we'll start doing some new ones. I bet you thought that uh, as soon as I was done with this bottle, that that would be the end of Vintage Joe's Basement, and no more reruns, and he'd start making new ones. <clears throat> well, I've still got the rest of the case. Um, but maybe my staff can help me get rid of it in time for the season premiere. We'll see. I might have to do it all myself. In the meantime, sit back, relax, pop a cold one, or even a room temperature one, and enjoy episode 29, Shooting Things, of This Week in Joe's Basement. Hello, and welcome to the second in our series of science lectures here on Joe's Basement. This week, we look into the personality of the elusive King Zeke. Just what do we know of this King Zeke? Well, we know he comes from the planet Zarkom Frolinger. He's the son of the Reverend Squirman Herman Billingsley, attends the Bad Boys School in Lower Goose Island, has a pet dog, Hojacker, and a drug-using brother, Hal the Looper. Using the evidence at hand, let us now visit with our panel of distinguished experts. Jim, what kind of person do you think wrote these letters based on your expertise as a psychologist? Uh, well, Joe, I think that these letters, first of all, were not written by a child. And I have a few reasons for thinking that. First of all, if you look at this envelope that this one came in, it's very creative. It's got three kinds of stamps on it the American flag stamp, the love stamp, and an owl stamp. Um, and then it's very cute, says speed it up three times as fast. But I don't think most kids have access to three kinds of stamps, at least not the kids no. that live in my house. No, okay. For damn sure. Um, now, in addition, uh, another reason I don't think this is written by a, a child is that the spelling errors that are made are not the kinds of errors that a child would actually make. In fact, they're the kind that most people might stero stereotypically think a child would make, but not the kinds that an actual child would make. So, for example, Hi, Joe the Gwait, uh, G-W-E-A-T, okay? Right. I mean, Gwait and, uh, is the kind of thing that an adult might think a child would say, or a child might make this kind of error. But in fact, in literally thousands of psycholinguistic studies of children's spelling, we very rarely see G-W-E-A-T as a spelling. And, and on and on, there are several other kinds of examples like that. I tested these earlier to see if they were authentic or if this was a joke with uh, the divining crystal. And apparently, it is not a joke. OK. The people are very sincere. They like your show a great deal. Mm -hmm. But there's no way that I, I could believe that they're living under a bridge or that they're from some other planet, wherever they're saying they're from. All right, so uh, let's see the beginning here. King Zeke. The following on his uh, trademark King Zeke special stationery. He instructs me to start here at human letter two on the upper left. He writes, Hi, Joe the Gwait. Your show made all of us lower Goose Island inhabitants go crazy. We will be having an underground festival in your honor. You show is the only real thing on human television. We have a few shows like yours shown on our planet, Zarkham Frolinger. So what do you make of his claims that he lives on planet Zarkham Frolinger? <laughs> And rubbish. It's rubbish. There's no such thing as planets on the Bollinger. <laughs> I mean, I um, took a very interesting course once, actually, in the solar system, and th there's nothing like that. Uh -huh. Really. Zach and Frolinger, right. Yeah. Now, the only problem that we might have 
is if we have to return it, you know, because he don't have a return uh, zip code on there. I see it's also from the Institute for Psychoanalysis. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so <laughs> perhaps we can send it to them and they can forward it to him. Let us look now at one of his letters. Notice the stationery is topped with the characteristic King Bee crown. Indeed, he makes frequent references to this King Bee. Interestingly enough, there is no King Bee. Rather, in the hive, we find a single queen bee responsible for laying the eggs, several drones which fertilize the eggs, and worker bees who build and maintain the hive. Therefore, it is safe to assume that King Zeke is comprised of an abdomen, thorax, forward head region, from which protrude mandibles and antennae. <coughs> My stupid pop, Squirman Herman, won't let me tell you what a cron leader equals. He undergrounded me for a week because I got in big trouble in the Lower Goose Island Bad Boy School. All I did was get our dumb geek teacher, Arthur Hosewinkler the Stinker, fired again. I, King Zeke, probably put crazy glue on his empty seat. Us kids be happy and quacked up, but my pop, Squirman Herman, undergrounded me now. Tell Herman to ease his stance, plural, on me, basement Joe. Please, I plead. I get bit by too many rats in my underground punishment chamber. Herman will listen to you. Uh, this is Squirman Herman. And uh, he wants to know if we have been too harsh on Donald for undergrounding him for a period of human time of two weeks. Yeah, I think that's a bit harsh, though. I think two weeks is a good amount of time for a parent to underground his kid. Yeah, that seems to be, uh, for most of the offenses within the discipline code, a maximum suspension is 10 school days, which would be two, two weeks. If he's got a, if he's got a record of, of, of doing uh, pranks and vindictive things, then you might, you might uh, uh, hit him a little bit heavier than you would a, a first-time offender, mm -hmm. especially if the kid has a good record otherwise. I'd like to find out then whether Squirman Herman will, will in fact punish him by putting him underground for two weeks. Okay, then I'll ask the crystal. Is Squirming Herman going to put King Zeke locked up underground for two weeks? This is interesting. It's moving affirmatively. Yes, it's answering yes that he is going to do this. Now, I don't know where this is going to be done or how. I hope he feeds him while he's locking him up. Yes, I'm afraid I do. As a matter... <clears throat> so, in conclusion, we will now consult our panel of experts and have them summarize their findings. This is a sick person, Joe. It is. Yeah, this is sick a sick person. You're, you're a psychologist, though. Sick in what way? Yeah, no, this person needs to immediately get in for therapy. And I hope that they're watching the show. I mean, this is the reason I agreed to go on this show, is that I <laughs> hope they will go to a hospital and uh, try to get some help. Can you put a finger on, you think, what his problem is? Um, could be a split personality. Could be um, just a compulsion to mimic a split personality. I think basically this um, weird Zeke or Captain Zeke or King Zeke or whoever he is, is uh, basically someone just like everybody else out here. You know, he's just putting his feelings and thoughts down in, um, in words. I don't know, I think it's a few King Zeke's working where I work at. Zeke, I'm picturing with uh, like a wavy or a curly uh, brown hair, longish, not real long. Uh, possible small beard or just stubble on the face. Mm -hmm. And you said he's a white person? Yes. Do these um, letters, the way they feel, remind you of anyone you've ever known or any type of person you've ever known? No. No, I've never come across this exact energy.
Hi. All right. So, hurry me to shooting range, and I'm gonna learn how to shoot. So, uh, ooh. You know, um, I have a lot of friends who like to shoot, and they like guns, but I've always been kind of frightened of them. I don't, uh, I don't quite understand what people see in them. I mean, guns kill people, right? I mean, guns and people together kill other people. And uh, so I've always been kind of like, ah, you know? Because they're not like on TV. I mean, these are real. <sighs> but these guys tell me it's a lot of fun, and they make it sound like a lot of fun. And I always like, you know, pellet guns and things like that. So I figure that the real thing's got to be, got to be even better. I mean, you can shoot, take out your hostilities on uh, foreign dignitaries. I mean, where else can you do that, right? So I figure it must have some merit. So I'm going to learn how to shoot and see what this is all about and really understand all this. Hey. Hey, Mark. Mm -hmm. Teach me how to shoot, please. Sure. OK. All right. You'll need one of these. Thanks. And we're going to go in there. All right. Ready? After you. How about here? It's good. Ah, uh, jeez. They're giving me a uh, facsimile of a person to shoot at. I think that is a nice touch. Okay. Just like on the police shows. Yeah, this is this is a little guy. I suppose he's supposed to. Uh, a criminal mm -hmm. or something. But, uh... okay. What did that, what letters and numbers mean that just so you can tell us that you, that you hit a K5D2 instead of I hit him in the heart sort of thing? I guess so. I'm not exactly sure. sure. I think these have to do with scoring and things like that. Like if you've got a competition criminal shoot. Or what something. do you get the most points for? Uh, uh there. Okay. That's, I guess that's, you know, that's like triple letter score. So. so aim down that way. Have a good firm grip there. Okay. And this is your safety. So take that off whenever you're ready. And like this? However you're comfortable, however you're supporting Okay. How do I pop down the safety, this thing? Pop down that? Okay. All right. So the safety's off. And I get this motherfucker right to the 5X. <laughs> How'd I do? All right. So I was aiming for this. So I think the first one was probably. I think these these two I think are mine. Oh, or okay. Maybe, this is definitely yours here. Okay. So I hit him three times out of five. Yeah, you hit him three times out of five, maybe even four times. I'm not sure if that's right. Or not. Oh my God! So a total amateur like me, who recoils at the sight of a gun, shot a man at what 50 feet, and badly injured him or killed him four times out of five. Yeah. Uh, I, the thing I, I think I remember most about the accounts that I read uh, wasn't, it wasn't so much like the way, the way he shot the, the kids in the playground, the grade school playground, or like the, they even, like the way they described the kids going down and like the, the blood pooling on the small of their back, you know, kind of like welling up, not like spurting, but just like a well, or even the way they had described how his like head came apart, you know, at the end. <laughs> that, uh, I mean, that was, that was interesting, but what I remember most, oddly enough, considering, you know, that I knew Michael and, and he was always a very, uh, I mean, he was something very strong and really pretty frightening about the guy, but, but not this line, just I, I, in relationship to how I know him. I couldn't see it, but it stuck in my head, and the reporter said, and this was, you know, the exact phrase, he said, when the shooting stopped, he stuck the barrel in his own mouth. You like to shoot? 
Yeah, yeah. I, I shoot a lot. Yeah? I enjoy it. Come out here on the range a lot to shoot? Well, in the mornings, I'll shoot once in a while before we start work if I have time. Or on my day off, I come up and shoot. Or, you know, after work, if I get off early, I'll go shoot a few rounds. Mm -hmm. How'd you get started on that? My dad started me. Um, I was about 14. We started shooting. Yeah, you just, went out to the range, or did you go hunting? or We went out in somebody's backyard. Yeah? And uh, it was private property way out in the stick, so it wasn't like we were hurting nobody. We went out shooting some 7-Up bottles. And, <coughs> Ever since then, I just started liking it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it was fun. It was it's a fun sport. Why do you think you have more women these days? I don't know. I think it's probably for home protection for themselves. They they feel better and yeah. And there's a lot of daring for the sport. You know, they like the shoes. Come in with their husbands. They shoot with their husbands. We have Ladies' Day on Wednesdays, and ladies shoot free all day on mm -hmm. Wednesday. And. Uh, Basically, you know, a lot of people like it for sport and enjoyment. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, do you own a gun? Oh yeah, several. You you keep them in your home? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like do you keep them for home home defense? Yeah, I keep uh, a couple of them loaded in the house, and like naturally, because everybody does, I would I would imagine. Once you learn how to use the weapon safely, it's no more dangerous than a knife or you know a long stick for that matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot more people die every year of knife wounds and of uh, beatings from baseball bats than gunshots every year. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. It's not guns that kill people. It's people wanting to kill somebody is what it is. And if you don't have a gun, you're going to use a knife. If you don't have a knife, you're going to use a stick. It's, it has nothing to do with guns. It's, it's the person wanting to do it. I feel like if, you, you know, if you're a law-abiding citizen and, you, and, it's a, and it's in the amendment that you have the right to bear it and uh, own and bear arms, and I think you should have them as long as you know how to use them and you're not a, uh, you know, and you're not going out robbing banks and things, you know, with them. If we didn't have arms, only the bad guys would, and therefore we'd always be in fear. Um, well, Portland, Oregon, they just issued 2,200 concealed permits now, this year. Last year they issued nine. Their crime rate has dropped. 33% in six months. Do, you know, burglars are scared. You're, you know, your thieves are scared now because they don't know who has a gun or not. Your law-abiding citizens aren't using them, obviously, because the crime rate should drop 33%. And, you know, if you're a criminal, you know, would you want to go rob somebody or rape somebody knowing that they might be one of those 2,200 people that are carrying a gun with them? Busy. All right, I think we got enough of this. Let's wrap it up.